Okay, classical friends. Undo that bow tie, loosen your top button, maybe pour yourself a finger of whiskey, because today you're gonna play your first jazz standard. About eight years ago, I really plateaued in my playing. I had gone about as far as I desired to go classically, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next, but I loved playing the piano. The way I got myself off of that plateau was by taking what I knew about music and narrowing it way down into a specific focus. I took my love for listening to jazz music and decided to pursue how to play it. By doing that, I opened up a whole new world to me of things that I didn't know and new challenges to go pursue, and that really excited me. I started listening to as much jazz piano music as I could. Errol Garner, Oscar Peterson, Bud Powell, you, know, you name it, all the classics. So I started to really intently focus on these recordings, and I built this canvas where I deconstructed all the different ideas and things that I was hearing, and I mapped them all out so I could get like the dependencies in order and kind of work toward a starting point. What I quickly found out is that there isn't like an epicenter where all of these things branch off of. There's not one place to start that then you can layer everything on top of. But through my own teaching, I think I found a way and I want to share it with you. While there isn't like this core epicenter, there are three themes that kind of go through all the entry level topics. That would be melody, comping rhythms, and bass line. And each of those three things we can distill down to a very simple minimal idea. And if we can do that, we can put those three minimal ideas together into a single technique that we can use to apply to every tune that we ever want to learn how to play. If you're a totally beginner player, this probably is too advanced for you. I am expecting you're coming with some moderate classical knowledge, you know, time signatures, key signatures, where the notes are on the piano, how to move your hands around, things like that. I also expect that you know how to form all of your seventh chords, major, minor, half diminished, diminished, etc. As jazz topics go, this is a relatively basic, simple idea. But everything in jazz is hard. <laughs> so please don't make the mistake of thinking that you're going to be able to do this right away. To really fluidly master this is going to take you a couple months. But I do think with a couple practice sessions on an individual tune, you can start to get the authentic sound that we're after. And you'll start to really feel accomplished. Let's jump right in learning this technique on Just the Way You Are, a standard by Billy Joel. Okay, to get started, I'm pulling out my trusty Dr. Beat metronome and I'm setting it to 60 beats per minute. And that's because our target tempo is 120, but when we play jazz, we want the metronome to click on two and four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All right, we're gonna pull up the lead sheet and we're just gonna play root notes, single notes in our left hand whenever the chords change. Usually that means we're gonna play on beat one, but if the measure has two chords, we'll play on beat one and then on beat three when the second chord comes in. One, two, three, four. Cool. Okay, step two, we're gonna keep doing the bass line exactly the same way, we're gonna add the melody in the right hand. Now the melody is notated for us on the lead sheet, but you don't have to take it as literally as you would see it here. We really wanna focus on getting a swing feel in here. We're not playing straight eights. We're playing one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four. Because our bass line is only playing on the down beats or on sometimes on beats three, it's always playing on the beat. It doesn't swing at all. That means the swing feel has to come from other things like the melody. So let's go through this, adding the melody and try and really feel that swing feel. One, two, three, four. Okay, step three is all about chords. We're gonna simplify our four note chords down to only two notes, the simplest possible way that we can play a chord. The way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna remove the root and we're gonna remove the fifth. So our first chord here, which is D major seven, 
has four notes, D, F sharp, A, and C sharp. We're gonna remove the root, we don't need it. And we're gonna remove the fifth, the A. So that leaves us just two notes, F sharp and C sharp. Now notice here you can play this two different ways. You can play the F sharp on the bottom and the C sharp on top, or you can reverse it. You can play the F sharp on top and put the C sharp on the bottom. Right, so let's start with this D major seven. We said we're gonna play F sharp and C sharp. And our next one is B minor seven. So we take our B minor seven chord. We're gonna remove the root and the fifth. We're left with D and A. Our next one is G major seven. We're gonna remove the root and the D, the fifth. We're left with B and F sharp. Etc. We're going to do this throughout the whole tune. I want you to pay attention to how much your hand jumps around because if you do a jump like this up to here, right, it just sounds awkward and it's difficult to play. Instead, what we want to do is we want to rearrange those two notes so that we're always finding ones that are close to where we're coming from. I might take our D major seven and voice it with the F sharp on top and the C sharp on the bottom. Then when we go to B minor seven, we kind of have two choices. We can go here to D and A, or we can go from here to A and D. I think I prefer the first one. Okay, from B minor seven, we're going to G major seven. That would be B and F sharp. I'm gonna kind of air toward the bottom just because I like to stay in this area of the piano. Now we have B minor seven, and then we're going to D seven. This is called a three note voicing because our right hand is playing two notes and our left hand is gonna still play that bass line we worked on before. So it's playing the root and our right hand is gonna play the third and the seventh. If I'm moving too fast for you, there's an article down in the description below called Three Note Voicings. That holds your hand through this quite a bit slower. All right, let's put this step three together. We're gonna to keep our bass line going in the left hand. We're gonna ditch the melody for a second. It's coming back, I promise, but we're gonna skip it just for now. And all we're gonna do is practice playing the two note chords in our right hand with the bass note in the left. One, two, three. There's really only one chord in here that's an exception to our rule, and that's our A sus chord at the very end. We're just gonna play the A in our left hand, and we're gonna play a G triad in our right. Okay, step four is exactly what we just did, the bass note with the chords, but in our right hand, we're gonna change the rhythm. We're gonna focus on two different ideas for rhythm. The first one is a Charleston, which sounds like this. So that's on beat one and on the end of two. And the other option we have is the reverse Charleston, which is where we come in on the end of one and three. And three. Okay, we're gonna go through the tune now and we're gonna play this using those rhythms. So at any point, you can pick which of the two rhythms you wanna play and pull it out. One, two, three, four. Hey, that's pretty cool. Let's make a couple observations. The first one is our hands are acting independently. Our right hand is doing the comping rhythms, our left hand is keeping the bass going. You notice that they weren't mirroring. The left hand and the right hand are doing their own independent things. The second observation is that when we have two chords in the same bar, our chords are gonna change on the Charleston rhythm. 
So watch what happens in the fourth bar where we have the B minor to D7. I'm going to start at the top. Here we go. Of the two notes of that Charleston rhythm, the first note belongs to the B minor chord. The second one belongs to the D7. It changes in the middle of the pattern. All right, here we go with step five, and this is where things start to get really fun and a little bit challenging. So hold on, you can do it. We're gonna keep this comping rhythm going with our bass notes, but now we gotta slam the melody back in there too. And so here's what I wanna say. The melody right now is the most important thing. If we can keep the melody and the bass going, we can sacrifice the chords in the middle sometime. Don't worry about if you have to give up the chords now and again. But what I want you to do is kind of feel that Charleston rhythm going inside you so that whenever the melody note is resting or holding a note, what you can do is kind of reach down and play the comping rhythm. The other thing is we have to make sure that we keep the melody on the top all the time. So when trying to keep the melody on top, that might inform which of the two chord options we wanna use underneath it. So here we go with the metronome. One, two, three, four. So yeah, that's pretty tricky. Don't be discouraged if you can't do that right away. I mean, it really is gonna take some work. It's pretty difficult. Okay, step six is basically just a fancy version of step five. Basically what we're gonna do is our left hand is gonna jump up to help out with the comping rhythm sometimes. And so in a sense, once you get the technique down, step six actually makes step five a little easier. You know, in step five, we had these places where we had to go up to play the melody and then we had to jump way back down to get the chords and go up to play the melody. And that can be really difficult. But if we allow our left hand to come up and play the chords, we can let our right hand keep playing the melody or soloing or whatever. I hope you have a good enough sense of humor that you can laugh at yourself when you fall down because this step six is kind of like juggling and riding a unicycle at the same time. You're just gonna fall over and if you can't laugh at yourself and have a good time, then like, what's the point? I promise you though, with time though, this will click and it'll just become automatic. As you start to figure this out, I encourage you go slow and don't worry about trying to keep tempo at all while you're doing that at first. Let's look at the first few measures and see how we could do this. So our D major seven chord, I might let my left hand come up and play the chord. And our B minor seven, you know, my hands are already kind of in this position where they could share the chords. So maybe they'll share that one. And then for the G major seven, my left hand could play the bass and the bottom note here too. So we can share that one also. And maybe my right hand comes down to cover that D seven. Some places the left hand is really pretty natural to fit, in other places it has these big jumps. So just kind of embrace that. Wherever the left hand can cover easily, let it do that. And where the right hand can cover easily, let the right hand do that. All right, let's try to put this together and see how it goes. Hold on to your butts. A one, two, three, four. Obviously that's far from perfect on my end. I still have some work to do on it too. All right, last thing I wanna do is just show you how this works on basically any tune you can pull up. You can open your real book uh, <laughs> right there and you could play just about any song in the real book with this technique. So let's look at like Autumn Leaves. Works great. So I hope this technique will help you get your first couple jazz standards under your fingers. If you get stuck at all, go down in the comments and leave a note. There's great discussions going on down there. If I can't help you out, there's somebody in there who can. Before you get out of here, hit that like button. That's how YouTube knows to show this to other people. And of course, hit the subscribe button because we'd love to have you around for the next video. We'll see you in the next one.